Well, good morning, church. Good to be here in God's house today, gathered with you. And those of you online, welcome. Good morning to you on the live stream. Last Sunday, uh, we kind of finished up Romans chapter 1. We got to the uh, final verses there. We talked about how God gave mankind over uh, to sinful desires of their hearts. And some of those sinful desires were sexual sins. But many of them went beyond sexual sin. In fact, when we got to the end of the chapter there, we saw a list of 21 different sins listed, including things like greed and deceit, disobeying our parents, a gospel, or sorry, not gospel, that's not one, <laughs> gossip and slander. That would be gossip, wouldn't it? But by the time we got to the end of that list, it was pretty clear um, for all of us, I think, that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short in multiple areas um, in terms of God's holiness. Whatever temptations, whatever sins we may be personally struggling with, none of us is perfect. We all stand in need of God's grace. We all fall short of his righteousness, and we need Jesus Christ to rescue us. Now, one of the sins that is listed there in Romans 1 is same-sex behavior. Uh, we ran into that in Romans 1, verses 26 and 27. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Last week, we only looked at these two verses briefly because we were really looking at the entire passage. We were trying to get a sense of the overall scope of that section. And these two verses only address one particular sin among many sins. And we really just wanted to get a grasp last week of the overall message of the passage, the flow of the text, so we didn't zero in on any one particular issue. But as I mentioned last week, uh, this topic, this issue of same-sex attraction um, is a hot-button issue in our culture today. And so at times it's worthwhile for us to slow down and just take a Sunday and address a particular topic. And that's what we're doing today. Now, if you missed the message last week, it would be very helpful to go back and review that message because it really does give the overall context for where we're heading today. It falls within the flow of the text here in Romans 1. Um, so you'll definitely want to go back and listen to that, and uh, that will help you better understand what we're talking about today. As we get started, we need to be sure we make a clear delineation between same-sex attraction and same-sex behavior. Clearly, they're related to one another, but they are not one and the same thing. So to be clear, it's not a sin to have feelings of same-sex attraction. The Bible's clear that same-sex behavior is a sin, but it's not a sin to be tempted toward something. The reality is every single one of us is tempted towards some sin, probably multiple sins. We can all relate to temptation on, on that level. There are things that draw us away from God, draw us toward unholy things. But the temptation itself is not the sin. It's, it's the attraction is not the sin. It's the giving in to that attraction, giving in to that temptation, and pursuing sexual activity outside of God's design. In fact, it's a sin for homosexuals and a sin for heterosexuals when we're tempted away from God's plan for us. And we actually talked about this last week, God's very good plan for sex, his gift of sex to mankind. His creation design for sex is to be between one man and one woman in a covenant relationship of marriage. And he gives us the good gift of sex within that. So our sermon today is titled, Navigating Same-Sex Attraction. And the outline for this message is going to come from a threefold apology. The apology is from me to anyone who is experiencing same-sex attraction. To be clear, the apology is to anyone who is experiencing same-sex attraction. Whether you are resisting that, struggling against it, or whether you have embraced it, whether you have embraced a, a fully, openly gay lifestyle, nonetheless, this apology is for you and to you. 
And it's an apology, frankly, that many pastors and many churches ought to be giving. Before I explain what I mean by that, I need to make a disclaimer. I am far from an expert in this area. This is not my area of specialty. I'm not wanting to pretend that today or, or put on any kind of front that that's true. There are plenty of other people who are far more knowledgeable, far more experienced in this area than I am. In fact, that's why we've included the resources in the bulletin today. That's a limited, it's not a comprehensive list, but it's a beginning of resources that might be helpful to you because there are many other people who could, could say much more than I will today. Now, if I'm not an expert in the area, then why am I addressing it? Why not leave it for, to other people who are more capable, more qualified, more experienced with this? Well, simply put, I'm addressing it because I'm a pastor, and I shepherd sheep, and I want to shepherd all of the sheep. What I've come to realize more and more over 30-plus years of ministry is that many sheep even deeply devoted followers of Jesus are experiencing this attraction. They're struggling their way through same-sex attraction. So I apologize to those of you who are navigating same-sex attraction because some of us have failed to make ourselves aware of you, to make ourselves aware of the struggle that you're going through. Back in the early 1990s, uh, I was a young buck, a uh, young punk pastor, fresh out of Bible college. I got to tell you, you, it's too bad I wasn't your pastor back then, because back then, I was so smart. I knew everything about the Bible. I had answers to every question, and man, I was confident I had it locked in, figured out. I mean, I knew how to lay out any kind of argument, any apologetic for any issue under the sun, including the issue of same-sex behavior. Chapter, verse, I could quote them. I could lay it out for you very clearly how the Bible points to same-sex behavior as a sin. However, sadly, in the midst of that bold, youthful confidence, I had a significant blind spot. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You see, I was well-intentioned, trying to be a good pastor, but I was puffed up with knowledge. I was naive, which really is just a nice way of saying that I was arrogant. It's really what was going on. I thought I had the right theological position about same-sex behavior, and that's all you need, right? To know the truth about sin. What more could there be? And to be more specific, I thought that's all that the sheep in my youth group needed to hear. They just need to know that this is the truth. This is sin. That's all they need to know. Let's move on to the next one. So rather than using this knowledge to build people up, I was unintentionally tearing some of them down. I, I wasn't aware of it, but it was happening. Without realizing it, I was failing to love the people in the youth group who were experiencing this attraction, who were wrestling with same-sex attraction. I was failing to love them, failing to shepherd them. A very painful, confusing journey they were on failing to offer them help and hope that they needed. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 comes to mind. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. There's a young man in our youth group. His name is Tim. There were a couple different Tims in the youth group. But this Tim, who attended Robbinsdale Baptist Church, was in the youth group. I was his youth pastor. He was a high schooler at the time, but he was one of those high schoolers who was a little bit of a late bloomer. He was still fairly small for a high school guy. 
And unfortunately, because of that, some of the older guys, some of the bigger, stronger guys, tended to pick on Tim. Now, I did all I could to be a good youth pastor for him, to teach him God's Word, to protect him from these other students. In fact, I would publicly call these guys out that they weren't loving Tim well. And I would say, hey, knock it off. That's not okay. It's a Christian youth group. Behave that way. Love him. Be kind. I liked him. Tim was a fine young man. But there was one key thing that I failed to do as Tim's youth pastor. I failed to help him in his struggle with same-sex attraction. Now, to be fair, I had completely no idea whatsoever that he was struggling with that. But to be equally fair, I assumed no one in our youth group would have that attraction. No one in our youth group would struggle with that or experience same-sex attraction. Very uncommon. Very few people ever really bump into that. Doesn't need to be addressed. Boy, was I ever wrong. I missed it. Since then, I've become much more attentive to the fact that there are a number of people who wrestle with this, who encounter this, who experience this in their lives. And so I've done my best not to repeat that mistake. I, I probably have, but I've tried not to. I've at least become aware of it, trying to do better in this area. And I deeply regret that mistake. And so Tim is one of the reasons why I issue this apology today on his behalf and on the behalf of others like him who may have had a pastor who who didn't recognize there was something they could do to help out. Now, for those of you who are listening to this message who are younger, this might not make any sense to you, what I'm saying right now. This apology, like, why, how did that happen? You see, you're growing up in a world that is very much different than the world of the 1990s. Back in the 1990s, there was a policy in our country. It was, it was a military policy, but it was a policy that had a broader impact. The policy was don't ask, don't tell. Let me read a summary of this from Wikipedia. Don't ask, don't tell. Was the official United States policy on military service of non-heterosexual people instituted during the Clinton administration. The policy was issued under the Department of Defense in 1993, and it was in effect from 1994 until 2011. The policy prohibited military personnel from discriminating against or harassing closeted homosexual or bisexual service members, while barring openly gay, lesbian, or bisexual persons from military service. In other words, at this time in our country's history, one of the key ways that we addressed the issue of same-sex attraction was by not addressing it. We addressed it by not talking about it. Don't ask, don't tell, just... And then, it, then it'll be fine. Pretended as if it didn't really exist. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that our culture kind of got drawn into that way of thinking, and many of us pastors and many churches got thinking that same kind of way. As a pastor, we won't ask you about that. And, and we'd really prefer that you not tell us. But that's never a good way to deal with real life concerns to help people who are hurting, who are wrestling. And I hope we've learned our lesson on that one. Some of us have failed to make ourselves aware of the issue, aware of the need, aware of what other people are going through and experiencing in their lives. And so that's why I feel compelled to offer the apology not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of other pastors and other churches. For the record, they, they didn't ask me to. <laughs> But I feel compelled to do that for other pastors who, like me, have made their own mistakes along the way. So if you're listening to this message, if you're 
experiencing same-sex attraction, if, if you know someone who experiences same-sex attraction, I want you to know that I'm sorry that I haven't been a better pastor to you, that there haven't been more pastors aware and engaged in helping you with this. And I'm sorry we haven't been a better church community for you because pastors lead that community inside the local church, and we have a responsibility for the kind of church we become. We've become very quick with our theological explanations, our theological positions, but we've been slow to offer meaningful help where people need it. So for that, I apologize. I titled today's message, Navigating SSA, for two reasons. First of all, I've committed to getting better at navigating same-sex attraction as a church, to becoming better at that as a pastor, helping people, ministering to them. And if I don't have the particular skills or experience or ability to help someone in the struggle they're in, I want to help you find those resources. And they are available, some of them on that insert and some well beyond that. I also want our church. I want the evangelical free church of Bemidji to grow in our ability of helping people who are having this struggle, making ourselves available to minister to people who are tempted by all kinds of sin, struggling with all kinds of attraction, but this to be a place that's safe, that is good, that is helpful. The second reason for this sermon title is that I want anyone who is navigating same-sex attraction to know that there is help and there is hope. I want to assure you of that and, and proclaim that from the pulpit that there's help and there's hope available. So again, if you or someone you know is wrestling with this or experiencing this, you don't have to do that alone. This church is a safe place. I want to invite you to take out that half-sheet insert now, if you would, if you haven't already, the, the insert on resources. There are three sections to this. Again, it's not a comprehensive resource. The first section is books. There are three particular books that are recommended here. Each of them contains the testimony of someone who is navigating same-sex attraction and following Jesus faithfully. I encourage you to consider getting one of those books and reading one of those books, hearing from somebody who may have a better understanding of what you're experiencing and how it might work to follow Jesus in faith and obedience despite that attraction. The next section is handouts. They're actually available in the back of the church here, that number two there on the wall behind section two. There's a small table there, and you'll see some of these handouts right there. Just feel free to pick one up. If you're watching online, we would be glad to mail you one or email one. Just contact our office. The final section is people. It is good and helpful to read up on same-sex attraction, to learn more and study more. But there's a point where we need a real human being. We need someone to come alongside of us in flesh and blood and walk this with us. Because study can only go so far. At some point, lasting help, lasting hope will mean that someone is going to have to navigate with you on this journey. All of us need help and support from other human beings. It's part of how God has designed things, that we help one another and love one another in that way. And so we want to become a church where people do ask, and you can free, feel free that you do tell someone about this struggle, about this need you have for encouragement and, and advice. So there's a list of people on that handout. So even though a number of us pastors, a number of us churches have fallen woefully short in being aware of this need, we're trying to get better. We're working our way forward to provide resources and love and support for people who are in the midst of this. Our sermon series is called a, a Gospel That Sets Things Right. And part of what the gospel does when it sets things right is it sets churches right. It sets pastors right when we see an area of weakness or an area of fail failure. We set that right and we're trying to do that.
Now, the second thing I'd like to apologize for is that some of us have been mean and unchristlike. In contrast to those of us who've just failed to be aware of what's going on, there are, are some pastors in some churches who are all too aware. They have taken it up as kind of their banner to attack. Some groups have approached this same sex attraction with extreme hostility, self righteous judgment, literally going after people. And I won't go into detail here, but picketing at events with signs that we hold up that say things like, God hates gays, that does not represent the gospel. That is not the proper gospel response. And, of course, these people have used much meaner words and done terrible things, and I'm not going to get into all that. This kind of reaction is not only an overreaction, this is a wrong reaction. It is an improper way for God's people to respond. That is not how the gospel sets things right in this world. So I'm sorry that this kind of behavior exists in our culture And I'm especially sorry for those who publicly declare it in the name of God. It's regrettable. It's deplorable. This type of animosity and hatred toward people does not accurately reflect God's heart toward those who are struggling. Now, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we backpedal on God's definition of what is sinful. That's not what I'm saying. Certainly there's a place for us to uh, agree with God on His definition of right and wrong, and we talked about that last week. But what I am saying here is that this kind of mean and unchristlike behavior should have no place among pastors and churches. It's an overreaction to a sin by some people who are just extremely uncomfortable with this idea, with the reality that others are struggling with this. It makes them uncomfortable. That doesn't give anyone permission to respond with hostile words and hostile actions, especially toward those who need our help and our love and our guidance. A gospel that sets things right, it it takes sin seriously, but it also remembers the words that are right around the corner. In Romans 2, we're we're coming to it next week, Romans 2.4 declares God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So in light of those who've reacted in these ungodly ways, I apologize. I'm glad that our church has not been among the churches who have reacted this way. Nonetheless, I feel a certain responsibility as a pastor to offer an apology nonetheless. Please know this. Those kinds of mean reactions do not represent the heart of God or the heart of the true gospel. Now, there's one last apology, one final apology that I'd like to give today, and I hope that you will hear me out on this one. Unfortunately, in addition to all the other confusion that people may be feeling about their sexuality and their attractions and all that's going on, some of us have added even further confusion. We've muddied the waters even more than they already might feel muddied. In what might be a well-intentioned effort to love and accept people who are experiencing same-sex attraction, I'm sorry to say that some churches have made an overcorrection in the opposite direction of the group we just talked about. They've swung the other way. The third thing I'd like to apologize for is that some of us have given our wrongful approval of sin. In other words, rather than openly denouncing this sinful behavior, this same-sex behavior, some pastors and some churches have chosen to openly celebrate it. They would wholeheartedly agree with my earlier statement that historically, pastors and churches have fallen short of helping people with same-sex attraction But their response to this shortfall is to swing all the other way on the pendulum, way too far in the other direction. So some people who claim to represent Jesus Christ, who claim to represent a biblical teaching, 
have given their public support. Not just to those who are struggling with attraction, but they've given their full support to those who are choosing same-sex behavior. It's directly connected with the wrongful approval that we talked about last week in Romans 1.32. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And just to be clear, once again, in verse 32, it isn't just referring to same-sex behavior. It's referring to that whole list of sins, many sins, listed at the end of Romans 1. But one of the sins in chapter 1 is same-sex behavior, and that is certainly one about which we're warned not to approve. Romans 14, 22 declares, Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. You see, our failure to be aware of the hurts and needs of same-sex attracted people, that was wrong. And the, the mean and, and vicious attack of some against those who are same-sex attracted, that was wrong. But this is equally wrong. This is also wrong. To give our explicit and public endorsement of a sin that will separate someone from a holy God. A sin that will put someone in danger of experiencing God's wrath. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 asks a question and then gives a warning. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So my third and final apology this morning is that I'm sorry that some pastors and some churches have been careless in what they're teaching. But I've got to be brutally honest with you. This is much more than simple carelessness. What this is, is false teaching of a false gospel. Fact is, God does not take false teaching lightly. It's actually something with which God has very little patience because false teaching keeps us from a right understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that makes it a pretty big deal. You see, in our day and age, you can find a church that teaches what you want it to teach. It's not too hard. You can find a church to tell you what you want to hear. But what you want to hear may not be the thing that your soul needs you to hear. If you're experiencing same-sex attraction, I've got some great gospel good news for you today. Verses 9 and 10 are followed by words of hope in verse 11. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, some of the believers 2,000 years ago were feeling same-sex attraction. And some of them had chosen to behave based on those impulses. They were participating in same-sex behavior. But then they found help. Then they found hope in the gospel. They found rescue. If your same-sex attraction has led you to same-sex behavior, the gospel of Jesus Christ can set things right. You can be washed. You can be sanctified and made holy. You can be justified, made righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's good news. Notice that little word at the end there, our, the end of verse 11, our God. 
Same-sex attraction does not have to have the final word in your life's trajectory. God can be your God. You can belong to him. You can find your identity in him. The good news of the gospel is that through faith in Jesus Christ, there's help and there's hope for any attraction, for any temptation we may face. And this is something for which I will not apologize. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, would you please forgive us for the times we failed to make ourselves aware of the hurts and the needs of the people around us? And would you please teach us how to help, how to minister to those who are struggling with same-sex attraction? Lord, I pray you would please convict those who are being mean and unchristlike, that you'd open their eyes and help them see the damage they're causing, that you'd help them to realize they are not representing you well. Help them to repent of that. Lord, I also pray for any pastors and churches who are giving their approval to sin. Help them to see that they've gone too far, that they've gone outside the bounds of a genuine gospel message. But most of all, Lord, I pray for those who are having these experiences, who are feeling the struggle of same-sex attraction. Lord, I pray that you would please help them to find genuine hope in the gospel, genuine help and healing. May they put their trust in you. May they experience the power of your salvation. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. This message with a song, and then we will celebrate the Lord's Supper.